Hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and thank you for joining to the final Neo4j Live of the year. Uh, today, uh, enhancing QA, integrating unstructured knowledge graph using Neo4j and Langchain. I'm super happy to have uh, the guest of today, Sorov Yoshi. Uh, hi, Sorov. How is it going? Hey, Alexander. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. Super cool. I. I was uh, I was forwarded your um, your article by uh, by my colleague or our dear colleague uh, Tomas, who who said you have to read this you have to you have to invite him to to the stream, uh, and uh, Tomas yeah here he is Tomas is ready as well hi Tomas hey. how is it going good good you <laughs> yeah good doing doing well and I just said you were you were the one that that forwarded me and said hey uh, this article from from Zoraf, uh, who, who wrote it uh, a couple of weeks ago. And said, "Well, this is this is one one to have um, um, as uh, as a guest." And it's, and then we talked sort of. Uh, I said, "Hey, can we make it happen before end of the year?" And then this this day today was 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 one of the the the, the few options we had. So I'm really happy to have you uh, as our our final guest for uh, for today um, and for the year actually in 2023. So uh, it's a nice wrap up. Um, and obviously, we talk about knowledge graphs. We talk about Neo4j. We talk about Langchain. Uh, with a pinch of LLM, a rack, and, and all the good stuff. So I think it's it's good. Uh, it's a good uh, a good session. Leia, like uh, Alter Eagle says, ending 2023 strong. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's a it's a good one. I'm I'm looking forward to it. Uh, let me post the uh, article that's spurred all of this in chat, so you can you can have a look at it uh, later on. It's on the video description in YouTube as well. So if you want to to read on about it. Um, Sort of, you told me you have enhanced uh, yep. since since writing of, of of this this article. So we see even an improved version, more more uh, more uh, more details uh, and additional um, things have been added to it. So I'm 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 very very interested in in hearing about that. So yeah, bef before we do that, I think it would be nice uh, if if we get a, a short intro as we usually do in these in these streams. So yeah, um, yeah so sort of. Um, what are you doing currently? What is your, what is your motivation on uh, uh, behind knowledge graphs and, uh, and 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 lang chain and and maybe you know share a bit of of of, of what you do uh, outside of uh, being on a stream. <laughs> so basically, this is my first time you know being on a stream, honestly. So um, I'm super nervous, but super excited at the same time as well. Um, so I'm basically a final year data science master's student at the University of Southern California um, mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, um, California. So I kind of love developing um, interesting and innovative solutions um, in a way to solve um, complex and difficult problems because they essentially get you um, thinking about it and kind of just brings the best out of me. Um, other than that, um, I'm specifically interested in machine learning research um, with a major focus on graphs because um, I really got into graphs about uh, two years back um, during my junior year where I saw a couple of lectures um, of machine learning with graphs course um, offered by Stanford University taught by Yorel Escovec. Mm -hmm. um, so that really got me interested and excited about it. And since then, I've been doing uh, you know, research at DBpedia, which again is a knowledge graph centric organization, um, where the objective is to basically translate a natural language question into a Sparkle query. So Sparkle mm -hmm. is basically an RDF query language, like pretty similar to Cypher. Um, yep. um, and then since I started my master's, I've had this opportunity to work with some of the best professors at USC itself, um, at Information Sciences Institute, um, where again, most of my research is at the intersection of graph machine learning and generative AI. Uh, generative AI more recently, but you know most of about it is uh, graph machine learning, knowledge engineering, um, and working on a uh, sort of a DARPA project, which was like pretty comprehensive, involved a lot of different teams. So, yeah, that's about it. Like I'm a student still, so most of my time goes into like uh, reading, reading um, theory <laughs> books and all of that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very impressive, very cool, and. Uh, again, Alter Edel says, love seeing all the use of vector embeddings in in architecture. Um, so yeah, I, I think in your your article you also talk a lot about the vector indexes and 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 the capabilities we added to to the Neo4j graph database. But vector indexes in general are are a super interesting topic. So yeah, it's it's great. It's 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 great that your your course of studies touches all of these these 
relatively, I would say, modern, up-to-date technologies as well. It gives you gives you space to explore, gives you gives you gives a motivation to explore it. Um, that's that's really that's really great to to see that um, this is not only you know you talk about especially this this year. I think everybody wanted to do something with Gen AI, uh, and and um, if if you are allowed to do so, that's that's really that's really great. Um, and yeah, yeah, you're, you're one of the biggest that, inspirations. Good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You're absolutely correct. I think one of the biggest inspiration definitely is um, Tomas's work and the work that Tomas and his team does. Like one of the projects which I like saw was the NALLM project, um, and that like really got me uh, into you know the power of knowledge graphs, um, especially when combined with large language models and generative AI in general um, has like a lot of potential to you know power a lot of systems um, to really bring the best out of the systems as well. So yeah, I mean the work which you know Thomas is doing and Neo Four J in general is like crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Thomas is. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I just wanted yeah. to say it's Team Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> it's Team Thomas, of course. <laughs> uh, but yeah, awesome to hear that. Uh, and uh, yeah, but but it's also interesting. I, I didn't know because you said that you work with or for or with DBpedia. So it's not like that you only uh, write, uh, how you say, uh, uh, nice uh, blog posts, but you actually use this in production, right? So that's where I, I, I'm very interested to hear all the things that you learned in production, because it's very different to make something work, and it's nice for the blog post, but then putting <laughs> that into production, right? It's like a whole other beast. So uh, <laughs> I see <laughs> the head. So that's why uh, I'm very interested. Uh, and it's awesome. I didn't know uh, that uh, you do that. So I'm, I'm very, I'm looking forward to hearing what your insights. So now that you learned from me, now I can also learn from you. <laughs> yeah, awesome. hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> So do, do you I have some ahead. insights you, you you can share already? I mean, maybe just just one sentence or two about about you know the difference between uh, you know the theoretical approach and the blog post and the actual approach uh, with with DBpedia, or is, is that something you would we we should do later on or at some other point in time? Um, I just think one of the major insight is that I've been using um, you know. AWS SageMaker to, um, you know, basically power these racks. And so mm -hmm. one of the things which I found like really insightful is that I haven't had the opportunity to work on like very large data sets. So most of my work really goes on, you know, working with toy data sets. So most of the insights that I get might be good enough, but I'm not really sure whether um, the systems would really work in production setting. So that is something mm -hmm. which um, I really need to try out um, working with larger data sets, working with, um, you know, teams who have been working on this for a long time or an existing system, essentially. Um, so that is something, you know, I kind yeah. of found when I was working with some of these projects. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Um, with that, I think we can we can dive in. Uh, Sorov, you told me you have a couple of slides uh, which you which you want to go over. So we start with that, and then uh, we go hands on a little bit. Um, as cool. ever, um, if you have questions during this during the live episode, just just use chat. Try, type it in there. I have my my eyes on it, so um, we have some time uh, towards the end or in between um, to answer them. So you know. Type type away uh, and um, and let us know um, if you have um, anything is unclear or maybe you just you like it then obviously also uh, also good to hear um, and then um, we'll we'll uh, we'll rock on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, I just uh, uh, share my screen. Yes, yes, please do. Yeah. Perfect. Here it is, and that's out of the way. All right. Um, I'll just go into the presentation mode if that's fine. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Got it. All right. So 
The topic that we're going to discuss about is enhanced question answering, integrating unstructured and graph knowledge using Neo4j and Langchain. So we've already um, had this conversation. I'll just, just skip over this slide. So the agenda is basically in the first 20 minutes, we'll talk about you know the different concepts which are involved um, in this particular RAG workflow. Um, the, the, the subsequent 20 minutes will go through the code of which where this particular section is divided into two subsections, that is RAG using Neo4j and Langchain and knowledge of construction using Neo4j and Langchain. And then finally, we'll end um, with question answer. All right, so first of all, like really quick, um, what is Neo4j? Neo4j is a graph database which allows you to represent information in a much more structured manner that is in a form of nodes and edges. There is a connection or a link between multiple nodes or entities if there's some sort of a meaningful relationship between them. And so knowledge graphs, um, you know, graphs in general have been um, used for a very long time um, to really solve very complex problems um, because they help you to model complex relationships in a way that you know vector representation or you know, representing data in a relational format or a key value format doesn't really help um, for solving problems such as you know complex recommendation systems, uh, real-time analytics, um, or for detection. Um, these are some of the use cases. And at the same time, Langchain is a, a large language model orchestration framework, which allows you to chain a lot of components and modules in the LLM or large language model ecosystem, such as uh, you know, prompts, um, agents, memory indexes, uh, output parsers, etc., um, to really develop automated generative AI um, applications really easily and really efficiently. From a use case perspective, I personally feel that they really complement each other really well because specifically in the knowledge graph space, there are specific um, problems or challenges uh, related to you know subgraph extraction or knowledge graph construction or you know uh, relationship um, identification between different um, nodes and entities um, or community detection. All of these can be you know we can build knowledge graph um, application using LLMs, um, you know, open air function calling, etc., to really provide a strong baseline solution um, for those specific problems. And at the same time, if you want to develop an automated recommendation system you know, using Langchain, we can have a separate knowledge graph um, you know, component or a module which can power those uh, you know, recommendation system, for example. So in general, um, I believe both really complement each other really well. Now, what are the benefits of knowledge graphs versus um, vector search? Or in other words, um, what is the benefit of knowledge graph in retrieval augmented generation? So before that, let's um, kind of understand um, very quickly what vector um, you know, search is. In vector search, the first step is to segment or chunk a larger doc, a longer document into smaller chunks, embed those using an embedding model, and store the vector representation in a vector store. And then when a user asks a question, the goal is to retrieve the most semantically similar um, chunks from the vector store and then answer the question. Now, imagine a case where you have a very, very long document. Um, and if you have a very long document and the information about a particular entity is spread across that long document, if you perform normal vector similarity search, there's a high probability that you might miss out on very important information because Using vector similarity search, you just retrieve top three or top five um, chunks from the vector store. So there's a high probability, as I mentioned, that you might miss out on very important information. And the answer, which would be generated using the generator, might not be very efficient or very accurate. However, if you construct a knowledge graph, the information about a specific entity um, might be about three or four hops away from the node of interest. So if you just extract that subgraph, um, you basically collect all of the important information required to accurately answer the question. And so in that sense, um, it's it's much more efficient. From what I've seen and from what I've read, um, using a hybrid approach is much more um, efficient. So you basically use vector search to basically retrieve comprehensive and contextually rich information from the vector store. And then you use a knowledge graph to retrieve structure aware um, you know, data or information from the knowledge graph. So I believe both work really well in tandem. Um, however, there might be use cases where um, I haven't experienced it, but I'm pretty sure that there might be use cases where you know only vector search might work well, or only knowledge graph search might well, might work well. But according to my experience, both really work well in tandem. 
So this is the RAG workflow, which I developed a few months back. Um, over here, first of all, um, RAG is an acronym for Retrieval Augment Generation, where the idea is to retrieve relevant information from a database, given a user question, and then use that retrieved information as context to you know, efficiently and accurately answer um, the question. The idea is to mitigate hallucinations. Hallucination is where you know the large language model outputs something which seems to be correct, but you know in reality it's false. So the idea is to really mitigate hallucinations, um, you know, provide more updated answers. Hence, RAG is much more um, useful compared to you know fine tuning a model every time when there's an update in the knowledge store. So this particular workflow consists of two halves. On the left-hand side, you have the indexing phase. On the right-hand side, you have the querying phase. In the upper left um, uh, segment, the idea is that we have you know, text data. We are chunking it into you know, smaller um, chunks, um, embedding it and storing the vector representation in the Neo4j vector index. Um, it, it's really important to segment it into smaller index because of the, the context, uh, sorry, the the limit of the yeah the context limit of the large language models um, and then essentially we create the neo4j vector index out of it and once we have the neo4j vector index next the idea is to construct a knowledge graph so in order to do that we basically need to use the open air function calling uh, feature uh, which we'll discuss in the later slides as well as strong prompt engineering to extract knowledge graph triples um, to construct the knowledge graph so once we have both in place, we are ready to query. When a user enters or asks a natural language question, we retrieve relevant unstructured information from the Neo4j vector index. But in order to extract information from a graph database, Neo4j graph database, we first need to translate the, the natural language question into Cypher query. A Cypher is basically a graph query language which helps us to retrieve structured information from a graph. Once we have the unstructured and the structure relevant information, we pass it to the generator. Now, in this particular example, the generator is a Mistral 7B, uh, 7 billion instruct model. It can be anything. It can be you know, any open source model or a closed model, for instance, um, and then use that information as context. And finally, with the question and the context, generate the answer and pass it again to the end user. So that's the high level um, overview of the RAG workflow. Now, before going to the next slide, um, I'd like to say something about this data layer right here. Um, the data might be messy and complex at the same time. It just can't be only text uh, when we work in the real world uh, scenario. So for now, we'll avoid the messy side of things, but focus more on the complexity. So it the, the, the data can be present in text format, and it can have tables, it can have images. So what I basically did um, you know, in the past few weeks is that I just modified the, the bit of code um, in this entire architecture um, just to adapt to the, the changes in the data layer. The overall, the overall architecture remains the same, but there's a few changes which needs to be made in the code base in order to uh, adapt to the changes in the data layer. So the PDF that we'll be using is the Google Gemini PDF, which um, you know Google just released their Gemini model a few weeks back, uh, I believe in the second week of December, um, yep. and we're just using that um, Gemini uh, Google Gemini PDF to you know perform rack. Cool. Maybe just uh, say nowadays, because uh, we have vision LLMs, you could also have like a knowledge graph, you have text index, but you can then also have an image index, right? uh which might be yeah. interesting uh, but yeah that's uh, something uh, very new that uh, that is yeah yeah potentially interesting as well yeah i think that, that's absolutely true i think there are different ways of implementing it for now what i did is like i summarized the image created into text and then extracted nodes and entities and then while representing it into a knowledge graph i yeah. added the image uris for those nodes as properties. So why, So when I retrieve those nodes from the knowledge graph, um, I basically pass those separately to the GPT-4 vision model, um, you know, so that it understands not only the text, but the, the image URI as well. So, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. 
cool. All right, so to retrieve information from the vector store, we'll have to perform vector search. So there are different strategies to do that. Um, one such strategy is parent-child retrieval strategy, where the idea is to summarize text, tables, images, um, and index them in a Neo4j vector index to represent specific concepts and store the actual documents, that is the actual um, you know, long text, the tables, and the actual images in memory to represent um, context retention. So, so essentially what's happening is that whenever a user enters a query, the chunks or the summaries from the from the Neo4j vector index, and then as a subsequent step, we retrieve the corresponding long text images um, and tables um, just to provide more, you know, more richer context um, for the large language model to provide more accurate answers. And at the bottom, we have um, a, rep a, ve a representation of the vector index in Neo4j Aura um, console. So the Aura Neo4j Aura console basically provides us, you know, cloud instances to host graph databases, um, allows you to visualize query graph databases very easily and very efficiently. So this is just the vector index representation where we have these nodes isolated in the vector space um, where the properties for each node contains the ID, the embedding, and the text. So it really helps to perform vector semantic similarity search over these nodes um, uh, in the vector index. So there are a lot of things which can be done with the new 4 vector index because uh, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't seen uh, you know, any vector database which allows you to link or make relationships between chunks present in the vector databases. So this is something which I'm trying to explore um, because that is very useful because in PDFs or for any data for that matter, if you have text, tables, um, images in that order, if you extract text separately, images separately, um, if, uh, table separately, the context between them is lost. So there's, if you want to really develop um, more efficient solutions, I think there needs a, there needs to be a way of linking them just to ensure that the context is retained. So this is something which someone can explore as well. All right, so now that we have the, the Neo4j vector index in place, the next step is to develop the graph search. So in order to develop a graph search, we first need to construct a knowledge graph. Now, knowledge graph can either be already made by an existing knowledge graph pipeline, but it can also be developed very easily and very efficiently, uh, at least a decent baseline uh, using the open air function calling um, tools and ability using uh, you know, prompt engineering. So on the left, um, as you can see, we have um, unstructured text. We are using an information extraction pipeline to extract structured information, that is nodes and entities linked together um, using some sort of relationship. The information extraction pipeline basically consists of multiple components. It involves core reference resolution, entity disambiguation, name entity recognition, relationship extraction, and then of course, uh, the knowledge graph. So I won't go into too much detail, but I'll just give you a high level overview of what each model does. So core reference resolution um, is a way of reference mapping um, the pronouns present in a text data to its corresponding entity, right? Name and recognition is a way of labeling entities present in your um, data set. Entity disambiguation is a way of differentiating different um, entities meaning whether two entities um, are the same or are actually dissimilar. Um, relationship extraction is a way of determining the relationship between two um, nodes or two entities in a knowledge graph. So previously we used to have machine learning models for each of these components, but now uh, using you know, large language models, I believe that they provide a strong baseline for constructing a knowledge graph because what you essentially need to do is you just need to um, put these instructions about uh, entity disambiguation or uh, you know co-reference resolution in your knowledge of construction prompt. And that really does uh, most of the work for you, at least a decent baseline, I would say. But definitely, if you want to build a uh, more you know, better knowledge graph for much more better, um, you know, whatever you're building uh, for any use case, I think it's a hybrid approach, I think is much better rather than just relying on uh, you know, LLMs. So one more important 
question to consider here while constructing the knowledge graph is that how do we integrate images? Now, of course, there are different solutions to integrate images in order to build multimodal knowledge graphs. But um, one way which I thought was to integrate image URIs for the nodes extracted out of the image summaries for the corresponding images. So as you can see on the left hand side, there's an image from the PDF. So what we do is first we uh, generate the summary of that image, extract the nodes. And for each node in that image, we basically uh, just attach the image URIs. So just to, so, so that the, so on the right hand side, we basically have a graph representation of an image from the image text summary, where the image URI are stored as properties for associated entities for context retention. So why I said that, because like, just to give a bit of context, the GPT-4 vision model basically requires, requires you to give two parameters. Um, one is the text and another is the image uh, URL. So it's, it's really important to really um, separate them and pass them separately. So whenever any of these nodes in the knowledge graphs are retrieved, we not only pass the text nodes and relationship, but we also pass those image URIs separately um, to the to the GPT-4 vision model so that we can have much more richer answer. So here is an, uh, a snapshot of the constructed knowledge stuff. It had more than 200 nodes and 100 plus uh, relationships. And so here the final um, part of this workflow is graph search. So once a knowledge graph is constructed, we can use graph cipher QA chain provided by Langchain, of course, in collaboration with um, Neo4j, where it basically requires you to pass in two inputs. One is the question by the user, and the second thing is uh, the graph schema, which is inferred from the knowledge graph. We pass it to the generate cipher uh, module, which basically outputs um, the initial cipher query, which might not be 100% optimized, but we need to optimize it just to ensure that we can retrieve uh, relevant information from the knowledge graph constructed. In the extract cipher step, we basically um, remove the backticks from the code block in the previous step, and then finally pass that cipher query to cipher query corrector module, which basically ident identifies if there are any incorrect direction of relationship between nodes and entities. Um, and then finally, we use the correct cipher query to query the graph uh, in order to retrieve um, in correct information um, from the graph. And then finally, we pass the information from retrieved from the graph as context plus the question to the final generator, which outputs um, the final response. All right. Um, so that basically concludes the, the working of the pipeline. And so here are the two. Um, notebook links, which y'all can refer and you know run when y'all have time. But I'll just go through the code um, just to ensure that everyone understands what each code block does. Cool. Um, yeah, so are there any questions uh, before we dive into the code, or should I just go ahead? Uh, there was a question from uh, Alter Eagle, uh, if what, what language you're using? Uh, he says Python. As, he's assuming Python is the is the main language, but uh, maybe clarify that. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just using Python, but yeah, I'm just using Python. But there are implementation of Langchain and JS um, JavaScript as well. Um, so one has the flexibility of doing it in JS as well. But for me, Python really works well. Cool. Uh, the other question um, was uh, maybe a little bit for Tomas as well is is about uh, how you handled this image because Neo4j technically does not have an image index um, and how, how how would you do that um, with um, when when working with images um, is there a, you know obviously it doesn't work directly maybe with metadata I don't know Tomas do you have a a tip mm, Yeah so basically. Just today, I published a blog post. Uh, <laughs> of course, you did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But basically, uh, you know, uh, basically, it's the same logic. Um, you you use a vector. You basically how you retrieve text is you embed it 
write, and then you store the embeddings or the index those embeddings. And uh, the same thing goes for the images, right? So for the images, most often you will see the clip embeddings by um, OpenAI, which are basically, it's called a dual encoder, but basically it allows you to use text to find images. And basically, but uh, at the at the output of that model is basically an image or the text can be translated into embedding. And then it's the same thing as with text, right? You just uh, use a vector index to find the most relevant uh, uh, images. And then uh, I would recommend the approach that Saura used. You just store the e image URL into the database and then from the vector index, you just retrieve the image URL, and then you do with the image uh, whatever you want. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you can, you can, uh, yeah, you can, yeah, like, like Alter Eagle says, text to embed, audio to embed, image to embed, I think I've, you can use, you can yeah. uh, basically take that that approach and apply to to different yeah, kinds so of basically uh, any modality because i think yeah. there's some like facebook embedding models where it's for the video audio i don't know something else but basically when i saw it basically you could have a submarine and all its sensors <laughs> embedded <laughs> right? and then use text to fight i don't know sounds of uh, various <laughs> maybe <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah it's uh, basically multi-modal it's called mo modality so multi-modal uh, embedding models uh, allow you to to do that yeah exactly yeah i think i read that blog today uh, it was super interesting uh, <laughs> if i had knew that solution about a few weeks back i probably implemented that too but yeah it's, it's super interesting let me let me take that up and post it in chat uh before uh, uh so everybody can uh, can look at it here it is uh, i think i've got it yeah uh, let me let me post that, and then we can uh, we can continue. There's a couple of other questions, but let's maybe let's maybe dive into code first, and then uh, do questions uh, later. Sounds All right, back back to you, Saurav. Oh, thanks. All right, so in this particular notebook, we are going to look at the performed ritual of data generation and essentially everything that we discussed in the presentation. This is the main notebook. So the first important step is to import the important and necessary libraries to run the entire project, um, load the environment variables securely from the .env file, which needs to be uh, in the root of your project. And then finally, to partition um, text, tables, and images separately, we'll be using the unstructured library to segment it. There need, there, you basically need to pass a few parameters. That is extract images um, in PDF equals true, info table structure equals true, um, and then some of the chunking um, strategy parameters to chunk that long text data from those PDF into smaller chunks. And finally, the last parameter um, that you can see is the image output directory path, where you basically need to specify some parts so that the extracted images will be stored there. Uh, can I just ask In you, is the, is the unstructured IO uh, free? Can you use it for free? Yeah, I think an open source. Yeah, it's Because uh -huh. I know they are very famous for their PDF extractions, right? So that's quite <laughs> cool uh, uh, when you're doing, because uh, uh, it's very useful because uh, like typically you only like the typical PDF to vector, you only look at uh, text, right? But if you ignore images that uh, uh, basically ignores a lot of information, right? And if unstructured IO can help you nicely extract both modalities, that's uh, super valuable. And if they do it for free, that's even more awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm pretty sure that they might have a priced uh, version as well. Um, but at least for a start, um, for, you know, 
open source developers, I think um, having a free version definitely helps. Um, yeah. Do, do you mind sort of do you mind zooming in a little bit so it's a bit, bit sure. bigger on the screen thank you i hope this is good yes perfect thank you that's better cool Got it. thank you yeah um so now having partitioned the text tables and images uh, in this particular code block we are basically collecting all of those um, elements in a list that is a list um, of text elements, a list of table elements, and we'll look at images in a minute. Um, over here, we are basically constructing the Neo4j vector index. We're using a parent-child indexing and retrieval strategy. As I mentioned before, we are indexing the summaries of um, text, tables, and images, storing it into the vector index, and um, having the actual you know, long text, images, and the table in memory. So in order to get the summary of um, the image, we need to use a GPT-4 vision model. Um, as you can see, it requires a prompt, which is basically um, you know, describe the image um, in detail, be specific about graphs such as barcodes, et cetera. And then we have the actual image URL, um, which basically gets us the summary of the actual image. Uh, do you have any so idea one... how much you paid for the images to be processed? So that's actually bad on my side that I didn't look into it, but I will just run it for a couple of times. Uh -huh. So I didn't really run it on a very large data set such for me to look at the pricing thing. But for instance, if I was working on a very large data set, which involved a lot of calls to you know, open AI, then definitely I would look at it. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, I just made a couple of runs like about five to 10. So I'm pretty sure it's like within $1, I believe. Uh -huh. Okay, so relatively cheap. Yeah, because I didn't run enough. Otherwise, technically, it's expensive. Right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, because I, I tested it a little bit. But yeah, it's not so cheap. Like, I did 300 yeah. images, and it was like oh. 10 bucks or something like that. So it's not the cheapest thing, but it, 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 it really depends on the resolution that you use. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you experiment with uh, other open source models such as like Lava? Yeah, uh -huh. I did. Lava isn't good, but there's one model that I want to remember the name, but there is one open source model I found on Hugging Face that uh, did well, at least for the describing, right? Because the same, yeah, you, you're doing the same thing describe the image in detail. I just said yeah. be specific and concise because I don't want um, <laughs> long paragraphs. I just want short paragraphs. Yeah. But I found one open source model that works OK. Uh, so there is uh, a potential for open source models and to lower the costs and uh, all of that. Yeah. yeah, I think next year we'll see a lot of these uh, open source models um, coming into power. So I'm just wondering what will open AI specifically to, to make it more efficient because, you know, of course you have certain tasks where you can make things more efficient, but most of the general tasks, um, such as normal question answering, you know, retrieval augmented generation tasks are already, I think, really working really well with GPT-4. So one thing that they can really do is like lower down the pricing in a way that more audience can, you know, use them instead of focusing more on open source models. Um, but I still believe that um, open source models are definitely uh, the way moving forward, for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, on that, I would agree. And uh, maybe because now we have like one model that can do everything. But maybe 2024 is the year where we have some like custom models that can do only custom things, but they are like 100 times cheaper and faster. Because now we see like even the 7 billion models, right? You said some of them are quite good for like question answering, like retrieval augmented generation. So how I see it basically that, yes, like you, you would still want to have like 
uh, basically let's say let's put it like this you use one big model for like uh, development so you see what's possible but then when you have everything in place now you go and train like custom models so that you can lower the price uh, be more consistent, uh, uh, incre uh, uh, increase or not decrease latency. You know? But that's that's I don't know. Maybe if that's twenty twenty four or twenty twenty five. But uh, the I, I feel like like custom task LLMs are definitely coming. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. Um, yeah, I believe most of the organizations working on specific tasks will you know develop their own custom models as we are i think we're already seeing them being posted on hugging face uh, i think there'll be a more of those models coming out as you mentioned in memory four yep all right um so here is here, as I mentioned before, we are indexing the child chunks in the neo Fujia vector index and storing the parent documents in memory. Um, so here's an example of a table extracted from unstructured, um, uh, using unstructured from the PDF. Here is its summary. And for a question, for, ex for instance, which model outperforms on the M MLU benchmark and is very similar to PAM2, um, we basically retrieve most um, semantically similar vector semantically, semantically similar um, document um, from the PDF. And so one last step is to basically create a final chain, which basically, given a question, retrieves the, con the, retrieves the relevant information from the vector store, splits that into text and image, because as you know, that in this particular case, the retrieved information can either contain long long text, it can either contain table, or it can also contain image. But we need to split them and then pass it to the GPT for vision prompt function, which basically creates a final um, prompt, pass it to the GPT for vision model, and finally get the response. So for this particular question, which model outperforms in the MLU benchmark and is very similar to Palm 2, we basically get the correct answer which is Gemini Ultra uh, outperforms and so on and so on. And so for, uh, for other example, which models apply safety filtering and quality filters over here again, you know, we get the correct answer stating that all the Gemini models um, apply this filter. Now, before going into the graph side for QA chain, we'll just quickly look at the, uh, the constructing knowledge graph notebook from tables, text, and images using OpenAI functions. I've already described of how we are doing it, but we'll just quickly look at the code. So again, the first step is um, importing important necessary libraries, um, loading the environment variables securely. Now, OpenAI function call allows you to extract um, information in a much more structured and reliable way in a sense that you don't need to worry about the, the output which is generated. It's always going to be structured in a in a, in, a, in a manner that you can pass it to the subsequent functions without worrying about the format or the structural representation of the output from the large language model. So function calling is um, you know, truly, truly special. Um, but what's more important about function calling is that it uses something called as Pydantic class, right? So Pydantic class basically um, is a library uh, where they basically allow you to create some sort of data model, um, you know, some sort of a way how you want your final output to look like. Uh, it basically handles all of the data validation, you know, error handling, type checking, etc., and really enforces or ensures that the final output is in a structured manner. So over here, as our goal is to construct a knowledge graph, we basically have, uh, you know, this identity class where you have nodes and relationship, which are of type list of nodes and list of relationship. Uh, which in itself is a class which you know contains um, properties which um, you know is of type optional list property um, which basically contains key value pair. Um, so this basically ensures that the final output is um, you know much more structured rather than just random um, text which might be semantically similar but is not structured. So this really helps us to, you know, use the output um, 
and then directly feed it uh, into a graph database as a knowledge graph. So here, here are some of the utility functions um, to basically perform this particular um, this particular this particular function uh, that is def extraction chain. Um, over here, the most important part is this particular system prompt, which basically you know tells the large language model to construct a knowledge graph with these particular instructions. That is your top tier algorithm designed for extracting information structure formats to build a knowledge graph. You know, yeah, you should have consistency in labeling nodes. Um, here are some of the um, instructions that I specifically added for handling tables and handling image URIs that each node extracted out of the image summary needs to have a image URI, um, et cetera. And these are some of the other um, uh, instructions as well. This one is like really useful. And I think this one is like really important, the strict compliance one, um, which basically tells the model to other to rule strictly in one compliant result and termination. So these are some of the things which are really interesting and you only get to know once you experiment with it. So once we have the connection to the Neo4j graph database and the knowledge graph construction instruction prompt ready, we can basically put everything together in um, you know, information extraction function in a single function where you know, we are basically extracting the graph data using open air functions, constructing a graph document, and finally storing the information in a graph database. So we just now need to um, partition the data base again, same that we did for the vector index. Now we're doing it for constructing the graph. Um, it's the same steps, um, generating the image summary, extracting nodes from the image summaries, storing the image URI as a property for the nodes. So this is um, the overview of knowledge of construction. Of course, a lot of things can be done differently depending upon the use case, but this is generally um, a decent baseline to at least start working. All right, so now that we have the knowledge obstructed, we first need to connect to the new 4 graph instance. Um, here is the graph schema where, as I mentioned previously, um, where we have a lot of nodes, um, node properties, relationships um, in the graph schema. So I'm modifying the existing default cipher generation template. So cipher generation template basically gets a cipher statement to query a graph database. I basically modified it. Uh, with this particular line added here, which says that only if the node associated with the result cipher which contains an image URI, prop return it as well. So you can basically uh, modify it according to, a, and I also modified the cipher question answering template where I basically added this line right here, which says if the context contains link or image URI included in the final answer output. Um, so you can definitely um, depending on use case, uh, modify these prompts um, and then just add it again to the actual drive cipher QA um, from just append, just add it to this particular function right here. So for the same question that we saw in the vector index, which model outperforms in the M MLU similar to Palm 2, we get the resulting um, um, cipher query for that question which is correct because it contains Gemini Ultra. Um, and as it contains no image URI, it basically outputs down. I was working to avoid the image URI, um, this none thing, like just don't give me this particular um, uh, node value, um, but it was still giving me so, like the property for this node, but it was still giving me this particular output even after doing a lot of prompt iterations but definitely there is a solution for it and maybe some sort of a, i personally did a post processing step for it but definitely modifying the prompt in a certain way might avoid it um, and the same goes for this query as well um, and then finally, very similar to the vector index, we pass the um, generated response back to the GPT-4 vision model, which basically takes into account the text as well as the image URIs to output a much more contextually richer answer. Now, as a final step, we basically take into account the information that we retrieve from the vector index, as the graph database, and pass it to the generator model, which in our case 
is the Mistral 7 billion instruct model. Um, what we do is basically take the relevant data from the vector index, relevant information from the graph database, and the user question, of the, and then prompt it um, to this uh, Mistral 7 billion instruct model to get the final answer. So I basically use this model from Hugging Face and deploy over AWS SageMaker to basically deploy the model um, and pass this particular prompt which says, um, you're a helpful question answering agent, use the below context to answer the question, where the context one is the vector, retrieved information, and the context two is the um, you know retrieved information. Um, and it basically gave me a very precise answer. Um, and yeah, depending on the use case, you can modify the prompt and um, get answers accordingly. Um, and yeah, that's it. Like that's the overall workflow and the code walkthrough. Um, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any and have a conversation with you all as well. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, Sorov. That was that was great. Uh, I give the first question to, to Tomas if, if you have any, <laughs> any comments. Uh, yes, I had a, a, a bunch of questions. So the first one, when you use the Mr. 7 billion, like did it consistently return nice answers or did it sometimes do weird stuff and return weird <laughs> answers? So honestly speaking, um, every time it didn't give me the correct answer, sometimes it provided me incomplete answers. So although it was going in the right direction, some of the answers were incomplete. So I was wondering how to, you know, make that better because although Mr. 7 billion um, is much uh, higher on the the open LLM board, the research that I'm doing at ISI, like one of the projects which I'm working on, uh, I was experimenting with Lava, Lama 7, 7 billion and Mr. 7 billion instruct. Over there, I found Lama to be much more better. And over here in this case as well, Mr. doesn't really perform to the level which I really want it to perform. And so maybe this is uh, for the projects that I'm specifically working on. And the benchmarks which are there on the open LLM board are pretty specific. So maybe. Yeah, I mean, I would say you never trust any benchmarks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. <laughs> because first of all, all LLMs are non deterministic, right? So even if you check what people do nowadays, is they kind of do the chain of thought where they generate seven answers. And then if one of those answers looks okay, then they say, okay, we generated an accurate answer, right? So, uh, but yeah, I cool. guess I wanted to say, cause the, well, my experience is the similar, right? With those like 7 billion models is that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And it's not, uh, it's like go good to play around and, show that it works but like when you want it to work consistently right it's just uh, no <laughs> it's not yeah i mean enough. this it's interesting because uh, i mean you definitely must be knowing that open air recently uh, uh, in the dev day they announced uh, the seed parameter for you know consistent model output um, i'm not sure if there is uh, the seed parameter. Have, i mean even the open ai seed parameter that I just use it today and it's like, they just put it there for marketing, but it doesn't do actually anything. Oh, because <laughs> <laughs> they say they try to guarantee slightly more determinism, right? Uh, yep. But it's not because um, we uh, I was just playing around with generating some cipher statements and it's like, it really depends how the model is feeling like, right? And like, is it before lunch? Is it after lunch? <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's just how it that's is. Funny. So hopefully we'll get, because that's kind of the beauty of it. Because how is it? LLMs are quite good at uh, yeah. marketing because they can do a lot of words like with yeah. no meaning, <laughs> right? But when you need like deterministic, task where like you need the same output uh, always 
then you kind of see the prevalence of LLMs. Because if you just say write a poem, write and it writes a different poem every time, and sometimes it rhymes, sometimes it doesn't, you don't really notice. But when you say, like, give it a classification test, and you have your like five examples that you're testing on, and you, you expect it to be somewhat deterministic, but it's just not the case. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely that's true. just LLMs. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's I guess how it is. Um, there is a question from um, Alex. Uh, he asks. Can I use a prompt in the QA chain to provide more detail on nodes and relationships? Yeah, yeah, I think you can basically add in more constraints depending upon the knowledge graph, um, the type of knowledge graph that, you can, that you're trying to build. So that's definitely possible. Um, I think if you want to have more constrained knowledge graph, uh, that's the way moving forward if you're really working on domain specific um, knowledge graphs. Uh, yeah, you can definitely do that. Yeah, cool. That one question from Deepak. Um, they say, I really did not understand how, how you combine the chunks of data, data node with each other. So, for example, defining relationship and how your schema looks like, uh, the graph schema he means. Um, so, one second, if I understand the question. Well, maybe I didn't understand the question. Can you? Uh, maybe I, can I just read it in the chat? Yeah, it's in the. Um, I can. Let me. It's uh, more or less the last uh, last uh, last chat message from Deepak. Um, if you scroll all the way down. Um, Combine the chunks of the data node with each of its defining relationship and how your schema look like. I think um, what he basically means is um, how does the graph schema look the way it looks like? I think that's just the way um, you know you infer information from knowledge graphs, um, in, just infer graph schema from knowledge graphs, um, and that's how they are represented. Um, maybe I didn't really understand the question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, maybe we can uh, say that maybe because I don't know, you, you, did you specify any constraints? But if you don't specify any constraints, the, the LLM just decides what types of nodes and the relationships you'll have in the graph. Uh, so if that's the question, because yeah, uh, looking at graph Same. schema, yeah, so basically you can define what types of nodes and relationships you would like the LLM to extract. But if you don't do that, if you don't give it constraints, then it basically decides on its own and uh, just picks some relationships. Yeah, it is, uh, yeah. how do you connect it with each other, I guess? Yeah, that, I think that's that's what you explained, how how the graph came together um, when you when you fed the prompt, uh, when you when you prompted it to, to create the knowledge graph. I think that was like, I guess, um, how it was created. Uh, was was you defined that what's uh what's making up of the graph using the L yeah using the LLM exactly yeah. okay cool uh there's one more question or two more questions a bit more generic maybe uh but um i wanted to to get them out as well as one is from uh, uh from viva uh, he, she says what kind of diagramming tools do you use for the knowledge graphs uh, i think you, you you just showed screenshots out of i think it looks like bloom um, um but or, or did you use the new for j browser i'm not sure yeah, I use the Neo4j or a web browser uh, the, to yeah, yeah. visualize the graphs, which are constructed on the fly using Python yeah. code. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. I mean, you can you can you can use various various things. I mean, if you are um, working uh, alongside or inside a Python uh, notebook environment, and uh, Wireworks, for example, has a has a plugin to render graphs within a Python notebook, so that could be an option. Um, you can use Bloom, of course, uh, comes with Aura. You can use um, various other tools to um, 
to um, you know render the knowledge graph. So I think there's there's a couple of things out there if you, if you look for it. So um, some options there. Um, and the other question of social social media uh, asks: I'm working with PubMed documents and trying to disambiguate authors. Can you recommend solutions or papers that can suggest best ways to handle name disambiguation using graphs? Tomasz, I think you've probably written an, an article about this. <laughs> yeah, no, but I'm familiar with PubMed data because PubMed has an API and they give you authors in a very nice structured uh, information. So you don't really need LLMs and you don't need NLP because they just give you like a nice JSON structure with authors. Uh, so you can use that. But then if you have text that references those uh, authors, then maybe you can give uh, what, like the simplest option is you just give like uh, to an LLM like the the value in the text, right? So the name in the text, and then you give it possible options out of which it can choose. And you can use some like text distance uh, functions to find like top five candidates. And then you just say to ask LLM, please pick the most relevant one based on the options that you have. And you can do that uh, for like entity disambiguation where you don't have structured information. But PubMed specifically just use their API and uh, you have you don't need to do any disambiguation because they do it for you. Okay. Uh, yeah. There is a one more, one more add-on question from Alex. Multiple millions of nodes and relationships. You think QA chain can handle that that many data? Yeah. So I think um, if you perform parallel processing, like if you make parallel LLM calls, I think. Um, it would really help you um, save up on a lot of time. Uh, but the cost would definitely remain the same. So uh, because ultimately, the number of calls that you're making is the same, but just you're paralyzed, you know, paralyzing the process just to make it a bit more time efficient. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, for the importing. But for the actual reading, like querying the graph, it doesn't really matter. Uh, how many nodes are in the graph because Neo4j can handle multiple millions of nodes very easily. And I know people who have used uh, the QA chain. Uh, I, I, I was given a number like 15 million nodes and 200 million relationships. So it doesn't really matter how many nodes we have in the graph. For the QA chain, what's a bit more the uh, important is how complex is your graph schema, right? Because uh, uh, it's more about generating correct cipher statements than how many nodes you have in the graph. So yeah, you can easily handle multiple millions of nodes. Not a big deal. Just uh, make sure you don't return multiple million of nodes to the front <laughs> end, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. You can you can look look uh, in, in millions of nodes, but just don't. Uh, if if your query returns millions, then uh, it, it's not going to be fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Um, we're a little bit over time already. I, I think there. There are a couple of more questions, uh, but sorry, we cannot we cannot handle them right now. Um, but you know, there's uh, the Neo4j community. There's the Neo4j Discord server. Um, take 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 them there. Um, I think um, the community is is very helpful, very engaging, and uh, especially around the the, the Gen AI data science um, LLM topics. Lots of people that are that are there. Tomas is there as well, uh, answering. Um, oftentimes, I see him uh, answering questions. So. Um, you, you will find uh, friendly people uh, if you if you have more more comments, more questions, um, and yeah, uh, I think with that uh, we, we are at the end today. Thank you very much, Saurav. Uh, super great presentation, great walk through through the code and uh, and, and inside insightful um, showcase today. Um, really, really liked it. Um, it was it was really really insightful uh, for me. Uh, thank you too much for for. Coming along and uh, and, and in, you know giving uh, giving your your expertise uh, to to this uh, 
session as well. Um, and thank you for your for your time. Uh, yeah, well, thanks, that's... Alexander and Thomas, for having me. You know, giving this opportunity to present uh, the work that I'm doing um, it kind of means a lot for sure. Yeah, we're happy to have you. And uh, in 2024, we expect new articles and then new <laughs> presentations. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, like you, like we said in the beginning, this is this is the wrap up of uh, of of 2023, the final live live stream. Uh, thank you all. Uh, for for watching today thank you for watching throughout the year if you watched one episode thank you if you watched many many obviously thank you very much as well for that um if you're wondering where these are they are all on our youtube channel so if you go to uh, youtube.com um slash at neo 4 j i think is the link you'll find uh, all our, our previous episodes there um we have a pipeline building up for next year as well. The first stream will be a going meta episode uh, on the 4th of January. Um, so I'll see you then. Um, thank you all for 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 the time. Thank you all for, for watching today. And um, yeah, see you soon uh, in one of these live streams and um, have a good, you know, rest of the rest of the week, rest of the year, I can say today. Um, have have a good, good time. Hopefully it, it will be a little bit quiet for you all and enjoy. Uh, the holidays if you have them enjoy a couple of days um and um you know maybe you spend some time with graphs uh, over the over the next couple of days write a blog article and then you know you'll be uh, on stage uh, uh, next year for uh, for a nice presentation so if that's the case then please uh, let me know send us a, send us a ping and we're happy to have you um obviously present um for for one of these uh, in the future yeah with that uh, thank you everybody and uh, take care Bye-bye.